And now, enjoy a message from our lead pastor, Aaron Taylor. Hey, we want to continue the series we've been doing called Overcomer. And, uh, you know, this novel coronavirus pandemic, it, it demands things like social distancing, quarantine, isolation. Uh, so many vulnerable individuals have been exposed to this virus, and uh, as a result of that, we have kind of pulled back so that we don't overwhelm our system, overwhelm our hospitals, and, uh, and so many reasons, and collectively, we understand the importance of flattening the curve. And each of us doing our part to, to ensure that we don't spread COVID-19, uh, this disease, but this is not the only epidemic that we're facing right now. In fact, the requirement to separate ourselves from others comes at a time in America where we have been encountering and experiencing long before another problem, another epidemic, and it's an epidemic of loneliness. In fact, consistent with earlier research, the insurance company Cigna reported in 2019 survey results that said that three-fifths or 61% of Americans over the age of 18 are lonely or experience or feel the feeling of loneliness and that only grew and continued from their studies in 2018 mother Teresa in fact once said this the biggest disease today is not leprosy or cancer it's feeling uncared for or unwanted of being deserted and alone she went on to say that the spiritual poverty of the Western world is much greater than the physical poverty of our people remember she was serving in India she said you in the West have millions of people who suffer terrible loneliness and emptiness you know long before COVID-19 and any of this loneliness was an issue and long after this passes and this season goes away loneliness is something that so many people continue to experience in fact Rick Warren pastor of Saddleback Community Church out in California points out that you don't have to be alone to be lonely he wrote this he said it's not the number of people around you that determines your loneliness it's your relationship to them isn't that so true? Isn't that so true? As we continue our series, Overcomer, we're going to look at the Apostle Paul today, an apostle of uh, somebody that Jesus had appeared to, a spiritual giant who wrote much of the New Testament. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, that's where we're going to hang out today, uh, we get a very personal glimpse of a season in his life where he was battling loneliness. In fact, Paul's in Rome in prison. Probably for the second time, if you remember the first time he was in prison, he was under house arrest, and, and he might have been chained to Roman guards, but people were able to come and go, but this was a second imprisonment, and in this imprisonment, it was under Nero. His future looks bleak, and in fact, in contrast to his first imprisonment where he was at home, on this occasion, he's languishing in a cold prison cell, a dark prison cell, and he's chained up like a common criminal and he's lonely. In fact, he's very lonely. As we begin, I want to just highlight, Paul begins to highlight about four causes for loneliness here in 2 Timothy chapter 4. The first is loneliness that is caused by transitions in life. Life is full of transitions. It's full of changes. People transition jobs. They change schools. Children grow up and move out. In fact, uh, sometimes the birth of a new baby brings uh, uh, a transition in life, and sometimes the graduation of a, a high school or college senior can bring loneliness. Sometimes uh, you can be lonely in marriage, a divorce can bring loneliness, or the death of a loved one or a spouse can cause a struggle with loneliness or a transition. In fact, a little over a month ago, as a nation, all of us did not see coming what we have today in terms of terms like social distancing and separation. In fact, many of us have experienced transition in our life, transition in our job that we did not encounter or experience. And as a result of those transitions, loneliness is something that we can experience in fact, loved ones who are in long-term home uh, care facilities and being cared for, maybe it's a parent, a grandparent, or even a spouse, all of a sudden have encountered uh, visits that are no longer able to be in person but through a window. These are the kinds of things that can bring loneliness. And Paul was facing loneliness in this transition in his life he writes Timothy about this transition, and, and we see in this final transition, he's indicating that, that he believes that this is a transition where he is near the end of life. 
In fact, in 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy 4 6, 2 Timothy 4 6, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Transitions are hard, especially when they are terminal. But there's a new experience, and that experience that we deal with in transition can cause us to experience the feeling or emotion of being lonely. The second cause is loneliness from separation. Again, things like social distancing, being separated from family and friends can bring loneliness. Paul said this to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.9, do your best to come to me soon. He, he was lonely, he wanted Timothy to come to him soon. In fact, in the next couple of verses, we see that friends have left him and Luke appears to be the only friend that has stuck with him. Today, we can just pick up the phone, we can text someone, we can call someone. Uh, there's all kinds of ways, direct messaging through social media, even seeing those pictures, FaceTime, Skype, and Zoom have skyrocketed during this time, haven't they? In fact, before all of this, you could get on a plane and you can travel thousands of miles at a moment's notice to be with those that, that you love, especially in times of difficulty or crisis. Paul is feeling lonely during this transition, but he didn't have the kind of methods that we have today. And so he's encouraging Timothy, hey, come to me soon. I really need a personal touch from my friends. A third cause of loneliness is opposition. Loneliness from opposition. 2 Timothy 4.14, Paul writes this, Alexander the coppersmith uh, did great harm to me. The Lord will pray him, uh, repay him according to his deeds. In other words, not only am I uh, getting old, no, no, not only am I sitting here alone in prison, but I'm being persecuted. Uh, I've experienced persecution. We don't know who Alexander is. We don't know what he did to Paul. Maybe he slandered his name. Maybe he attacked his reputation. Uh, we're not sure, but we do know that the Greek word harm in this verse literally means to oppose or resist. In fact, when we are vigorously opposed, it can create inside of us a feeling of, of being alone loneliness of being misunderstood or being embarrassed or humiliated in fact Jesus warned about persecution as particularly of those of us as believers in Matthew 5 11 and 12 when he wrote this blessed are you and others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely accuse you on on my account rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for they also persecuted the, the prophets who were be for you now we might not feel exactly blessed when we're feeling opposed or persecuted and the temptation is is in those moments to pull away and to begin to draw away from others and isolate ourselves in an effort to protect ourselves but in doing so that can only lead to more feelings of loneliness a fourth cause of loneliness is also rejection and this form of loneliness is the most pain. In fact, when you've felt betrayed or forsaken at some time by those closest to you, it can bring all kinds of feelings of loneliness. Paul felt forsaken. In fact, a trial that he mentions here, he says this, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. When, when you can almost hear the pain in Paul's voice, here he was, you know what, when I, here, I, here I'm going through some, something that is very difficult and, and I find myself standing alone and no one is coming to help me. Rejection is one of the most difficult things that we can experience in life, whether it's being a child at school on the school playground or maybe a teenager in social media and you see that others were invited and you were left out. Maybe you feel the rejection of a spouse, you know, that's why divorce is so painful. And God hates divorce because of those feelings and the loneliness that that pain can bring. And some of you know that. In fact, there are some of you that are going through that right now. Rejection is painful because God has created us for relationship, for communion, and for fellowship. And these four causes of loneliness are not exhaustive. However, they do point to some of the things that the Apostle Paul had experienced and why he might have been experiencing this time of loneliness. So what do we do I want, to, I want to share with you five tools, five tools to combat loneliness today. First, when you experience loneliness, when you're facing loneliness, you must seek help from godly friends. You must seek help from godly friends. Now, at first glance, you might say, you know, well, that, that sounds obvious, but you know, oftentimes it's not. 
Sometimes we're afraid to admit that we need help. But throughout Paul's ministry, we see that there are over a hundred names that are written throughout his writings and throughout those times of friends, of godly friends and counsel and people that he surrounded himself with. The Apostle Paul was not a lone ranger. He didn't do ministry alone. In fact, he was always taking people with him. And so he realized that in this final challenge and experienced loneliness, he was not going to be able to overcome it by himself. In fact, to be able to overcome it, he had to invite others to come, friends to come and admit that he was lonely and he needed someone to be with him. 2 Timothy 4.9, as we read earlier, do your best, Timothy, to come to me soon. In fact, later on in verse 21, he says it again, do your best to come to me before winter. Again, travel would have been very difficult. They didn't have planes and they didn't have cars and they didn't have the things that we have today. And so when you were to travel in wintertime, it was nearly impossible. Paul was shipwrecked during a time during they tried to sail during the winter months. And so he says to Timothy, I need you to come and I need you to make it urgent because I'm lonely and I need my friends. In fact, not only does he want Timothy to come, but in 2 Timothy 4.11, he says, Luke here alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's very, very useful to me in ministry. You know, when Paul was facing these final hours, he realizes that he needed his closest friends, similar to Jesus. You know, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was getting ready to experience the greatest trial, he invited his three close friends, James and John and Peter to join him to pray with him there in the garden he understood the value of having friends and people around this is how Solomon the wisest king who ever lived this is what he said about it in Ecclesiastes 4 9 to 12 he said two are better than often one for they can help each other succeed if one person falls the other can reach out to him uh, for help but someone who falls alone is in real trouble Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one keep warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. (laughs) There's even better, a triple braided cord is not easily broken. See, that's what's so important of not just having friends, but godly friends, because together where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. And there is power when godly friends get together to encourage one another and invite the presence of God into their situation. See, when Paul faced his season of loneliness, he had Luke beside him, but he realized that just having Luke there was not enough. And so he invited Timothy and said, and bring Mark along with you because I need godly friends in this time. If we're going to overcome loneliness, we must surround ourselves with godly friends and be willing to humbly ask them for help. The second tool to combat loneliness, when you're facing loneliness, we must continue to serve others. I I love in verse 11 because he invites Mark to come along because he says he's useful to me in ministry. You know, when Paul was facing just months before his final death, the, the one thing that he continued to do was to look out of how he could minister to others. That that request stands out to me. In a cold, dark prison, Paul is thinking ministry. And you know, when we're going through seasons of loneliness, it can be normal for us to be self-consumed. We can say to ourselves, you know, this is a time where I just need to focus on myself. You know, right now I just need a little me time. You know, that's not all bad. However, sometimes that is not the answer to your loneliness. In fact, the answer to your loneliness is where in the midst of your pain, you don't seek to just minister to your need or for others to minister to you, but you look to minister and serve others. If you're feeling lonely, instead of focusing inward on yourself, focus outward on other people. Look outward to the needs of other people and God's grace will indeed be with you. In fact, when Corrie ten Boom was a young woman in the Netherlands, she fell head over heels in love with a young man only to experience the pain of rejection as he married a friend of hers. She was brokenhearted and she returned back home to her father feeling rejected how painful it was to have someone else chosen over you. And when she got home, her father said something very wise to her. He said, Corey, your love has been blocked and he married someone else. Now there are two things that you can do with block love. You can dam it up inside and hold it all up inside and it'll eat you up or You can re-channel it into something or someone else, and you can focus on other people's needs. 
Corey Ten Boom chose to do that. And when the Nazis had invaded, she chose to allow her selfless life to live under Nazi captivity. And you can read about that in the book, The Hiding Place. See, instead of building walls, we need to build bridges. We need to stop complaining. Oh, God, I'm so lonely. Oh, uh, Lord, I, I, I need your help. And we need to say, God, who do you want me to minister to? When you begin to take the focus off of yourself and your need and you begin to minister to others, God will use that to minister to your own need and your own loneliness. In fact, Proverbs 11.25 has some great wisdom for us. It says, whoever refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Thirdly, when you're facing loneliness, we must abide in God's word. Abide in God's word. There's an interesting request that Paul makes to Timothy. In fact, in verse 13, it's something easily you can gloss over, but he says, when you come, bring the cloak that I, the cloak that I left with, with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all, the parchments. Now, not only did Paul ask Timothy to come to Rome, but he said, bring the cloak and, and the scrolls and the parchments. The cloak was an outer garment of, of heavy material with a, a circular hole cut in. It was designed to keep Paul warm. He was in a cold prison, and, and perhaps this was something valuable to him. And in the midst of the persecution that led to his imprisonment, he probably left these things behind. And now he was saying, I need those things. But beyond just something to keep him physically warm, he knew there was something else that he needed, the parchments and the scrolls. And we don't know exactly what they are, but many believe that they were Old Testament manuscripts, possibly even the writings of the gospel or some kind of writings in scripture. And we can conclude that Paul, even though he was waiting to die, wanted to continue to study God's word. In fact, Charles Spurgeon used this, pa this passage to rebuke some pastors who weren't putting value on the study of God's word. This is what he said. He said, he, he, he said about Paul, he said, he is inspired and yet he wanted books. He had been preaching for at least 30 years and yet he wanted books. He had, been a, he, he had a, a wider experience than most men and yet he wanted books. He had written a major part of the New Testament and yet he wanted books. In fact, Paul was probably meditating on Scripture during this very part, probably the same Scripture that, that Jesus began to quote when he was facing his own time of loneliness on the cross in Psalm 22. And, and this is a psalm that, 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 that Jesus had quoted. Commentator Ken Hughes comments that there's something else remarkable here in this section. See, Paul's reference in this section to the lion's mouth is substantial evidence that he faced death on this in, in this occasion, and he was meditating on Psalm 22. The text here, look at the parallels. Verse 16, Paul says, everyone has deserted me. But in Psalm 22, 1, it says, why have you forsaken me? And then in verse 16, Paul also said, no one came to my support. He might have referenced Psalm 22, 11, there's no one to help. In verse 17, the Apostle Paul writes, I'm delivered from the lion's mouth. And that is an, an allusion to Psalm 22, 21. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. In verse 17, Paul says, and all, that the, all the Gentiles might hear it. Similar to Psalm 22, 27. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to you, Lord. And then in verse 18, Paul says, and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. And it echoes Psalm 22, 28. Dominion belongs to the Lord. If, if you really see what's going on, you can see that in these final moments of loneliness, the Apostle Paul is set on studying and abiding in Scripture. Paul was seeking the Lord near the end of his life. He was sinking his roots deep into God's Word. And you know what? When you're lonely, there is nothing better for you to do than to sink deep into the promises of God's Word. The fourth tool when facing loneliness is we must offer grace to those who fail us. You might remember that Paul asked Timothy to bring Mark along with him. If you know anything about that relationship, it wasn't always good. In fact, Mark had joined Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, only partway through to do the very thing that Demas and others that he mentioned had done, he left. So when it came time to the second missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take Mark along again, and Paul said, no way, and it caused a division in their relationship but here we find that that their relationship has reconciled paul finds mark to be useful in ministry not only at this time but also there were others who had abandoned him in his time of need verse 10 of second timothy chapter 4 says for demas in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thess 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 Thessalonica 
Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to Demalcia. Additionally, in 2 Timothy 4.14, Alexander the coppersmith did great harm, and the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Paul was hurt. He had been abandoned. He had been rejected. He had been hurt. And yet in the midst of that, we see an attitude where Paul is not holding on to these hurts, but rather he's putting them into the hands of the Lord. Not only do we see that, was he hurt by Demas and Alexander, but he was hurt by Roman Christians who didn't come to his defense when he stood trial. Again, verse 16, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. And look at, may it not be charged against them. There was widespread persecution. Perhaps these Romans were afraid of what it might mean to associate with Paul. Maybe they too would be thrown in prison. Nevertheless, no one came to his defense. But Paul's not hanging on to this. Just like with Alexander, may the Lord repay him. Just like these Christians, may it not be counted against them. What Paul is saying is, I'm not going to hang on to this. I'm not going to try to get retribution myself. Rather, I'm going to turn this over to the Lord. Why is that important in seasons of loneliness? Because when we allow ourselves to hold on to bitterness, because people will fail us. During this time, somebody will neglect to call us as often as we think. They didn't send me a text. I didn't hear from someone. It can be so easy during this time to say, well, nobody cares or they didn't care enough. And we can begin to hang on to bitterness and anger. And when you do, you shut yourself off from others and your loneliness only grows. But the Apostle Paul teaches us in these moments that we're to turn these things over to the Lord. We're, allow, we're, allow, we're to allow the Lord to come in and to bring healing to our lives. To not allow the bitterness to set in and the unforgiveness, but rather to release those things into the hands of God. We must turn over that failure of others and turn it over to the Lord and let him bring healing to our lives. Fifthly, when we're facing loneliness, we must offer, we must trust God's faithfulness. We must trust in God's faithfulness. Listen, 1 Timothy 4, 17 and 18, this is what Paul said, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through the message, uh, through, through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and, and, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. You know, though everyone else had forsaken Paul, Paul recognized that Christ had not that Christ stood by him and strengthened him to preach the gospel. In fact, in verse 19, Paul declared to, that, that Christ would deliver him. He stood in the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it was that same Christ that appeared to him on the Damascus road. It was that same Christ that trained him three years while he was in Arabia. The same Christ who comforted him in Corinth by saying, I have many people in this city. We don't know how Christ stood by him, whether it was a vision, whether it was a, a dream, a, a voice that he heard, an audible voice, or the actual presence, but we do know that he recognized that God was with him and that he stood trusting the Lord in his faithfulness. Very similar, first, Philippians 1, 19 and 20, he used similar language in his first imprisonment. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers, the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Look what he says, my confident hope is that I will in no way be ashamed, but that with complete boldness, even now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether I live or die. Listen, for me to live, living is Christ and dying is gain. What do we learn from this? We learn about a perspective that the Apostle Paul has. And that perspective is this, that in trials and seasons of difficulty, sometimes God's will is to deliver us from them. But most times it's God's will to deliver us from them through them. <laughs> Paul could trust God with both by God's grace that he would be faithful and whether that meant that he was going to deliver him from these and, and, and that he would be spared this or whether it meant that he was going to deliver him safely home. The apostle Paul continued to trust in God no matter through the season. You know, we don't know how long this season is going to last and seasons of loneliness aren't based just on our circumstances. Sometimes God's will is he will deliver us from them. Sometimes we have to walk through them to continue to rely on the faithfulness of our God. We may not understand everything, but we can trust that what God does, he does what is good and that he's working all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. 
God has good plans for his children. And so today, as we close this message and as the worship team comes to help us during this time of communion, I want to ask you, are you battling with loneliness? Are you battling and struggling with with different feelings during this difficult season? I want you to know you're not alone. Even a spiritual giant like the Apostle Paul experienced emotions and experienced a season of loneliness. So did Jesus. In fact, in his darkest hour, the night before he was crucified on the cross, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and all of his friends fell asleep. When the soldiers came and, and, and began to take him to trial, his disciples fled. Peter denied knowing him three times. And Jesus took the sins of the world and the cross upon himself. And he cried out this in Mark 15, 34. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, Jesus understands loneliness. He says, I understand how you feel. I care about you. And I want to help you. You know, let the Lord help you conquer loneliness today. Reach out to him in prayer. If you're battling loneliness, I want to pray with you today. And I want, I want you to begin to invite Jesus into your situation. I want you to say, you know what? I need help. Pastor, will you pray for me? You can, you can begin to email us, info at PainesvilleAG.com. You can put it in the comments if you need prayer today. But we're going to pray for you if you are lonely. And I want to invite you to invite Jesus into your life. And then I want you to get ready because we're going to close with communion today. Come on, let's pray. If, you need, uh, if, if, if you're in need of prayer today, you're battling loneliness, I want to pray with you. Bow your head with me right now. Dear Jesus, I pray for all of those that are struggling right now with loneliness, all of those that are battling these, spirit, these, these seasons of loneliness. I pray, Lord, that you will begin to be their encouragement, that you, you're the God that never leaves us nor forsakes us. I pray that you will begin to fill them full of your Holy Spirit and your presence in Jesus' name. Father, and we just come before you. We need your strength through these times. I just pray, Lord, that you will encourage those that are struggling and who are lonely, that, Father, you'll give them the tools to overcome loneliness today. We thank you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to close with a time of communion with you today, friends. So if you have your elements today, go ahead and, and grab them because... Uh, again, this is a time, a, a message of overcoming loneliness where we said Christ experienced loneliness. He experienced separation for the first time. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And communion reminds us that he experienced that loneliness and separation so that we would not have to be separated from the Father, but rather we could go directly to the Father, that our relationship and our communion with the Father could be made whole. And you know what? Circumstances don't change that. So let's remember that as we walk through this time of communion together. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which also I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray right now. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for your for your broken body we pray lord that you will just be with us today as we receive these elements together and we remember your broken body was so that we could be made whole we bless you in jesus name i speak healing in jesus name amen thank you jesus 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 in the same way after supper the bible says that he took the cup this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Sometimes God delivers us from something just like he delivered us from sin by his blood. We have been delivered from the wrath of God and the judgment of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But we also have the promise that he's coming again that this life is not all there is. And through his blood and because of what he did, we have the promise of eternal life. Let's remember that today. Father, we thank you for the promise of eternal life. That one day, Lord, we will not be separated from you, but Lord, we will be with you. Thank you for your presence that is with us today through the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for forgiveness and for grace. We bless you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's receive together. 
Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 